The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. Shall we pray? And so, Lord God, as we gather in this place, in a place that seems for many of us to be a place of unending darkness, help us to continue to trust in you, even when times are tough. Help us to continue to turn to you when it seems as though there is no way we can go on. And help us to continue to rest in you when we are exhausted simply by getting through each day. Would help us to remember that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And so, Lord, as we gather to worship you this morning, help us to do that. Help us to offer ourselves to you completely and wholly. Help us to offer our grief to you. Help us to offer our struggles and our sadness. And Lord, yes, help us to offer our tiredness to you, that you would become for us the stream in the desert, the light in the darkness the wind in our wings. And so, Lord, we offer this time to you, today, this moment of worship, and every hour, that your word of grace would be for us, the word that we need to keep going. For we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. And so, friends, the love of Jesus in me greets the love of Jesus in you. The love of Jesus in me greets the love of Jesus in you. And so we start our time of worship this morning as we sing the whole version, all the verses that we've been hearing over the last few weeks. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. Warren will lead us. foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. The charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she precious with every grace endued. Though with the scornful wonder men see her sorrow pressed, by schisms rest asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up. of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of a war, she waits her consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious her Be 
And so, friends, welcome as we get to the last of our sermon series looking on the church, the ecclesia of God, what it means to be church in a time like this. As we close off, I want to uh, give you some information in terms of what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Uh, next week is uh, a women's service for Women's Month, so the WA uh, will be helping us with that, and Celia Fleming will be preaching. Uh, it's going to be an interactive service, so do, do join in, do tune in for that. And the following week will be a family service, also interactive. And I hope it'll be lovely to hear from you as well. So I want to encourage you to send a video clip through that we need, can include in the service, simply saying hi, uh, maybe you want to say what you're doing, where you're at. Uh, and so we're going to have a time of greeting and a time of sharing with one another uh, and a short reflection on what it means to be family during times like these. Friends, this morning as we conclude our sermon series, I want to share with you a passage that uh, is certainly one that's been meaningful to me in my life, and I'm sure I've preached on it before, uh, but I'd like to share it again this morning and share some reflections from that. So I invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter, Peter's first letter, and to chapter 2 of that letter. Chapter 2 of Peter's first letter, reading from verse 4 through to verse 10. Uh, Peter speaks to his friends, God's elect, and he says, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builder rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What a wonderful affirmation of who we are as God's people. An affirmation that all God's people are called into the priesthood. All God's people are called to be ministers. All God's people are holy. And this is such an important part of who we are as a church, uh, that it's not just the ministers who have a certain job to do and everybody else can sit back and relax, but that everybody is called to, to be God's chosen people, God's holy priesthood in this broken world. The first implication of that, of course, is that whatever expectations you have of your minister are also expectations that you should be having uh, for yourself. If you expect your minister to behave in a, in a certain way, uh, well, you need to be behaving in a certain way. If you expect your minister to go about with a certain air of reverence, well, you need to go about with a certain air of reverence. If you expect a certain level of piety from your minister, well, that's expected of you as well. If you expect the minister's family to behave in a certain way, it applies to your family. Uh, and so on and so forth, because we are all priests working together for God's kingdom. And so, friends, that uh, thought brings us up to the end of our sermon series on being the people of God, the ecclesia, in times of crisis, in times of pandemic, uh, and really invites us to look at what it means to be a people set apart for God, to be a peculiar people, if you like, a people who are different from the rest of the world. Uh, we've seen 
over the last weeks how the ecclesia is a people who are called out uh, of society to do their duty. We've seen how we are a people that God needs in a broken society. We have seen how we are a people who are equipped, uh, a people who are sent out into this broken world to make a difference. We've seen how we are a people who, when we love the world, we become revolutionaries and can change things. We've seen how Jesus offers to us the gift of sight to be able to see the brokenness, that, to be able to see the people that we're called to love and to see where we're able to make a difference. Uh, and today we're reminded that indeed this is who we are as God's priests in a broken world. And so perhaps just to pick up again on a few of those last points that I mentioned that we've been discussing over the last weeks uh, before we look at some practical implications for us. For example, we're called to see what's going on in the world around us. Over the last few weeks, the Methodist Church together has been also on a journey looking at gender-based violence, particularly for uh, Women's Month, leading into Women's Month. And, and it's an important thing that we need to look at, not just as a church, but as a country. And if we're given the gift of sight, it means we need to see uh, what gender-based violence looks like in our society. We need to see what it looks like in our homes. And perhaps that means, for the first time maybe, opening our eyes to what's happening in our home and recognizing that it's not normal, that recognizing that it's not good, that it's not what God wants us to do or how God wants us to behave, and maybe making an appropriate response, whether that's leaving or doing some other response. Perhaps it means opening our eyes to what's going on in our church, uh, and perhaps seeing how men treat women or women treat men or what kind of gender dynamics there are. Uh, perhaps it means looking at what's going on in our communities and seeing uh, how people speak to one another, just becoming aware of those kinds of things, uh, having our sight restored to us. It means having our sight restored to us means perhaps for the first time seeing that just because we're living a comfortable middle class existence, that not everybody lives in the same way we do. Perhaps it means opening our eyes to, to folk who are living in areas where there's no uh, proper no access to clean water, where there's no proper sanitation, and recognizing not just that that's how those people live, but recognizing that this is a deeply unjust situation. Perhaps having our sight restored to us means, means becoming aware of the different the cries of different people in our community. One of the things that has also uh, come into the news in the last few months has been that the Black Lives Matter. And there's been lots of conversation about people saying, yes, but all lives matter and farmers' lives matter and, and all the other lives matter. And that may be true. Uh, but if I can use as an illustration, one of the things I, I enjoy doing is a bit of do-it-yourself around the house. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you're hammering in a nail, and uh, you, you miss the nail and you hit your thumb. Uh, usually there's a bit of violence and anger and some, some words that shouldn't be repeated in church. Uh, but, but when that thumb hurts, you grab the thumb and you hold it. Uh, you, you ignore the other fingers. Does that mean the other fingers are any less important? Of course not. But your thumb is the one that's hurting. And so that's the one that needs uh, care and attention at that moment. And, and so maybe the gift of vision is being able to see those places as people who are in need of special care and attention. And maybe it's Black Lives Matter, and maybe it's Farmers Lives Matter, maybe it's something else in society, but having the vision to see that, um, and, and not to say kind of blank or all lives matter, of course all lives matter, but at certain times there are certain things that matter more than others. And, and as those people cry out in hurt and pain and anger and frustration, uh, our, our responsibility is to see those people. And not just to see, uh, going back another week, our responsibility is to love and to respond out of that place of love. To say, what does it mean as God's people to go and respond in this way or in that way? How do we respond? And of course, as we do that, we know that God will equip us in the right way to meet those needs. And so with those few words as an introduction, I want to close off the sermon series by looking at, at what it means practically for us. What do all these things we've been speaking about being the ecclesia, what does it mean practically? 
and want to suggest three things to, to close off with and to hold on to as we go into the future. And the first thing I want to say is that being the ecclesia means that we have to have a journey inwards. Um, and perhaps that's something that we've struggled with during this time of pandemic because we haven't been able to meet together. But we have to have a journey inward that invites us again and again and again to the present of presence of Jesus Christ, who is our foundation, as Peter writes. He says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Um, uh, and then saying that, the stone the builders rejected, Jesus, has become the cornerstone. So we have to have Jesus as our cornerstone, as our foundation, uh, in whatever it is that we do. As we become God's holy priesthood, we are required to trust in Jesus. Uh, and I'm sure that's something that you expect of me as your minister. You would expect me to have a vital devotional life. You'd expect me to have a decent relationship with God and Jesus, that, that I'm firmly grounded on, on Jesus. And indeed, that's what God expects of all of us, uh, that whatever, whatever response we make to the cries in society, to the vision that God gives us, they are firmly grounded and rested on Jesus. And so we have the journey inward, a journey in which we have our rituals, which are important rituals that remind us in a visual way and draw us into a deeper spirituality of who God is. Lighting the candle at the start of the service, hearing the call to worship, uh, our prayers and our liturgy and the song uh, as we gather together, the way we are sent out from church with a blessing and, and hopefully not just a blessing, but also a challenge to go and be God's priests in the world, sharing around Holy Communion, gathering together as God's people to remember who we are, to be encouraged in one another's presence, to be encouraged by the Word of God. This is all part of the inward journey, coming together as God's people to remember that we are indeed a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, uh, coming together as God's people in our ritual, our liturgy, in our gathering. And so there has to be an inward journey of spirituality that is grounded on Jesus Christ. The second thing that I want to say this morning is that as much as there has to be an inward journey, there has to be an outward journey as well. Uh, we are called to go out into the world. We are people who are sent uh, to make a difference. We are, and not just people, but we are a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, a people belonging to God who are called to go out uh, and to minister to God's people. Uh, and you'll remember we spoke a little bit about what we are called to do. We are called to go out and to announce the good news, the, the ministry of annunciation, to share good news with people who are struggling, with those who are poor, with those who are in prison, with those who are oppressed, with those who are blind. We are called to go out and to share the good news, the evangelion, the great glad tidings of great joy. We are called to go out and to denounce that which is anti-kingdom, to speak out against the things that are wrong, to speak out against the injustice that we see, to speak out against gender-based violence, to speak out uh, against the grinding poverty and the, the huge inequality that we see in our country. Uh, and then, of course, we're also called to go out and to speak words of consolation, to come alongside people who are struggling, who are hurting, who are in pain. Uh, and maybe we can't do anything practically. Maybe we can't give anything. Maybe we can't stop anything. But maybe we simply need to be a presence, a shoulder to cry on and to say, hey, we're here. Uh, that's what it means to be a kingdom of priests. Uh, Peter writes to his friends, uh, he says that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Uh, that's what it means, simply to go out and to declare the praises. We've had the inward journey, now we uh, take the outward journey to declare God's praises. And it means being available. It means being available uh, as church, 
as people who can go out into the world. Remember, I said earlier on that the same expectations that you place on me are the expectations that are placed on you as part of the kingdom of priests, uh, part of the holy nation. Uh, and I know uh, from those times when I haven't been available uh, and people have needed me, uh, there is an angry response. Why didn't you come? Why weren't you there? Why couldn't you do this? And there may be very valid reasons that I had, but nevertheless, the response is angry. And the same applies to us as church. Uh, when we face all these challenges that we face as a community and a country, the right response from a broken world is to say, where is the church? Where were you during these times? You, you saw what was happening. Why didn't you say anything? Where were you? Uh, we are called to be there, not to be in here. Yes, there's an inward journey, but there is also an outward journey uh, where God needs us in a broken society. Friends, the last thing that I want to speak about is that we're all in this together. That it's not the church who is going to do something. It's not the minister who is going to do something, but we all together are going to do something with all the resources that we have together. We've spoken already about the different gifts that we have to, to move into the places of brokenness. And for some, the gift may simply mean a listening ear. For some, it may mean sharing resources. For some, it may mean making opportunities available that weren't available before. But we come to this broken world as God's church, as God's ecclesia, the people who are called out to do our duty, to go into the world and to share God's love and God's grace. And God equips us with all the resources that we need to do the work that he wants us to do. Some of those are gifts, some of those are material resources. But we come together as God's people to say, what have we got and how can we use it? Uh, and that's very important when it comes to tithing. I, I haven't spoken a lot about tithing during the sermon series and I don't want us to get caught up in money. I think the difficulty is that too often as a church, we have seen our tithe as an obligation. And we say, oh, the church wants more money. The church needs money to pay the minister. And we almost get into the space where we say, we give the church money so the minister can be paid to do the work of the whole church. Uh, or we give the church money so that somebody else can, can do this work of ministry. But God calls us as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. All of God's people are called together uh, and, and it's not a case of, well, if my arm's twisted hard enough, I'll give a bit more so we can keep paying the minister. It's a case of saying, what resources have we got together as God's people? And how can we use them to do this work of ministry that is for all the people? And, and, and perhaps it's a sadness that we've got into the space where we'll pay somebody else, because that's not what it's about. How do we use our resources to be God's priests in a broken world? Not to send the one man that we pay, but together to be uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation in this world that is in such a difficult space uh, always um, particularly highlighted now through the coronavirus but always the world is a broken place of broken people and God calls us as his people to make a difference and so friends as we get to the end of our sermon series I hope that has been a helpful journey that as we've journeyed together we have indeed heard what God is saying to the church and to us during this time, that we've been encouraged and inspired to, to be the priests that God calls us to. I'm aware that sometimes we need to take a deeper journey with Jesus to get to that point. Uh, and so uh, at the beginning of September, from the 6th of September, we're going to be doing an intentional service series saying, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And simply looking at Jesus, simply looking at what it means to walk in his footsteps. And that's, that's a personal journey. Uh, not a corporate journey, but a personal. What does it mean for me, Neil, to follow Jesus today? Uh, and I believe that as we do that, we will be brought into a place together as a community where we can make a difference in the world. That as things begin to change and things begin to open up, we will indeed be God's chosen people, a holy nation, a people belonging to him, uh, called to be his priests in the world, to declare his praises, to call people out of darkness and into his marvelous light, a light that has never been put out. I pray that it would be so for you, as it is for me. May we pray. 
And so, Lord God, we give thanks for the word which you have given to us today and over the last seven weeks. We pray that this word would not return to you empty, but would make its place in our hearts and our being, that we may know who we are, who you've called us to be, and how we can change your world. And so, Lord, we pray for ourselves and we pray for your people everywhere. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we began by singing about how Jesus uh, is the church's true foundation. Uh, and we're going to close off as uh, we sing about Jesus being our vision. That as we go forward, we will indeed be able to put our vision and our hope and our trust in Jesus. And Warren's going to lead us. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my life. Be thou my wisdom, thou my true word, I ever Thou with me, Lord, Thou my great Father, I Thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee Sword for the fight, be thou my dignity, thou my delight, thou my soul shelter, thou my high tower, raise thou me heavenward, O power. Riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, I keep. treasure thou art oh thank you lord i king of heaven of to victory one may i reach heaven's choice bright heaven's song Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Oh, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. And so, friends, this brings us to the end of our sermon series, looking at the role of the church, the ecclesia uh, in this broken world and in these strange times. 
Uh, I remind you that we begin a new sermon series looking at what it means to be a follower of Jesus uh, right at the beginning of September, the 6th of September. In between, we're going to be doing things a little bit more lightheartedly. We've got a women's service happening next week. Uh, Celia will be leading it for us. And then after that, we've got a family service. And we'd really love to hear from everybody. If you've, you'd like to send a video clip in simply with your family saying hi, that would be great. Uh, we'll share that in our service next week. And so, friends, I invite you to join hands with those around you as we say the grace together. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.